Hi everyone, my name is Tim Edwards and welcome to Bristol Talks Economics. Tonight we are delighted to be joined by none other than Lord Jim O'Neill, Chair of Chatham House. Jim has had an illustrious career both in finance and the public sector. He is probably best known for his work he did during his time as Chief Economist and Chair of Goldman Sachs Asset Management uh, during the 2000s, where he coined the BRICS acronym, Revolutionising Emerging Markets Investing. Since his time in finance, Jim has been active both in, in charity and in government, where he, he advised the government on the Northern, House, Northern Powerhouse Project and other related economic uh, issues. Jim's most recently been involved in the report on antimicrobial resistance, a topic that has gained even more relevance with the, well, the obvious COVID-19. Uh, we're really excited to welcome you, Jim. Welcome to Bristol, albeit virtually. <laughs> nice to be here. Cool, so we'll get started. Um, I like the idea of, uh, what was it you described it as? Northern house power. I like that. <laughs> uh, the, um, so the over, a, over a year ago, way back in 2019, before we even knew what COVID-19 was, you gave a talk in Bristol on the impacts of antimicrobial resistance. Can you explain what yeah. antimicrobial resistance is and its the impact it could have on the world. So it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and as I remember joking with you about um, before, when I was first asked to do it, uh, I couldn't actually pronounce it. It took me days to get it right. And it's so funny how many people do. But what it really is, it, it, it's, it's inclusive of antifungals, antibiotics, uh, and other such things. Of which Antibiotics is, um, without doubt, the, the largest component. Uh, and if I just concentrate on antibiotics uh, to highlight it, um, these things uh, are very powerful and they adapt and change a bit like uh, how a, 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 a pandemic type bug does, although this is something you can't treat the same way. Uh, and as a result of it, um, treatments that have been developed for managing the infection risk of certain anti, uh, certain uh, bugs become uh, rendered useless. Uh, and so what happened, what you need, if you think about it immediately, and why I was asked to do it as an economist, you need to find new ones that are useful to deal with the new strains of bugs. And crucially, uh, and unlike the current episode of this pandemic, um, reduce the excessive need for using them because the more uh antibiotics are used uh for the wrong kind of infection uh, and i'll give you an example in a second uh the quicker they lose their effectiveness so the classic example is uh is when you go to your doctor tim and you you're trying to find an excuse to not attend a lecture or whatever it is you say i've got a terrible uh uh, sore throat and uh, your doctor that's so irritated by you being the 10th student there that day just writes a prescription for an antibiotic to get you out of his office um, despite the fact he is just guessing whether actually you need an antibiotic or not or um, and so what we need is to uh, is to stop that problem. Mm -hmm. And what we showed is if we don't, as we creep through time, it is quite possible uh, that a staggering number of people could die around the world from something to do with antimicrobial resistance. If you take it to the developing world, 
where Richard's, A.R. Uh, Richard, I'll highlight your book here. Richard has written uh, one of the most fascinating applied books from an economist I've ever seen, including traveling to some very interesting places, not all the emerging world, but a number of them. Um, drug resistant TB is a huge problem in the emerging world. Uh, our, my review became famous for predicting that if we don't do anything about it by 2050, you'll have 10 million people around the world dying every year. I think we've just, well, we're, we've COVID about 2.2 or something. Mm. Um, so it could be 10 million people a year. Uh, and we would, the loss of life and the loss of productivity that would go with the consequences of that uh, would cause the global economy to lose over a 35 year period, something like $100 trillion of the potential it otherwise had. Mm. And uh, so it's kind of colossal. Um, and uh, a lot of people were, were kind of shocked by it. Uh, some, some, and I'm spending a lot of time on this because it's relevant to COVID, some to the point of saying, nah, they're just, it's just dramatizing. Things like that could never happen. Mm. Uh, welcome COVID-19. Have we, have we seen any policy responses that you've discussed in your review that link with COVID or any parallels in terms of the uh, like macro level response to it. To um, antimicrobial resistance? Uh, yes. So, so is there anything, how do I put this? Would you say we're better or worse prepared from, uh, for AMR from our experience with COVID? Are there lessons we can learn? Uh, okay, I see, I see Ben's question. Uh, the classic one, does, does, does this outbreak of the pandemic make me more or less optimistic about dealing with AMR? Um, by and large, yes. In the immediate future, and I am, ex I am immersed in all of this world, I'm spending a, even more time on international health uh, economics than I did then because of this pandemic and because of the experience I've got. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that if we have time. But... Uh, I'll try to give you a brief answer, uh, three parts. First of all, I'm a very strong believer in the concept of never letting a crisis go to waste. Uh, something I learned from my near 35 years of active life in finance. Um, I am living proof that you can get to the other side of a crisis because I'm, I'm still alive. Uh, and I've survived the financial ones. And so one of the keys in life that I learned, uh, and I think this is true way beyond the world of business, it's true with every individual and certainly when it comes to leaders of companies or leaders of countries or whatever, that how you react in a crisis uh, can, can set the tone of the next era that follows. And it's also, in my opinion, important to reflect on the circumstances around society when a crisis hits so it gives you a chance to deal with it uh, better if you think that way. Second mm. thing I would say in that regard, one of the huge frustrations of the AMR review is that until that moment and through a lot of our journey, a lot of people in the world of finance and economics where Richard and I come from and a lot of finance ministers sort of like, oh, oh don't talk to me about antimicrobial resistance. what's that got to do with me? You should be speaking to the health guy. Mm. And uh, it was very economic policymakers to focus on health challenges. And my goodness me, given the scale of this economic collapse in 2020, it's done it for us. Mm. And so there is uh, all sorts of interesting ideas flying around, some of which I'm, I'm right in the middle of, of trying to permanently bring uh aspects of economic and financial thinking uh to the world of dealing with uh future health pandemics and amr in the same way that's going on with climate change mm. i was about uh, to link into that in terms of like mark carney's work on integrating climate into climate i was talking climate. i was I, I i can't so this time next i can't unveil this today because it's not public yet but i'm on something called the monty commission which is 
named after the uh, an Italian prime minister from a few years ago that's been set up independently for the whole of the WHO's European area, from Iceland all the way through uh, to the ex-Soviet uh, Republic, all those countries, including the whole of the EU and the UK, and 53 countries. And our task is to try and come up with ideas that will make the world a better place post-pandemic. <clears throat> and next, <clears throat> next Tuesday, a week today, we will... Uh, publicly uh, release some of our early ideas. And some mm. of them are going to be, well, most of them are going to be based around trying to link uh, aspects of economic policymaking uh, and preventing the scale. You, can't, you won't be able to stop uh, any kind of cr old crisis in the future, including health ones, but trying to mitigate them and be better prepared is, is quite, quite feasibly uh, something that society can do. And actually, you mentioned Mark Carney. I was talking to him yesterday specifically about one of the ideas we've got mm. uh, that links very much to his own experiences. That's very exciting. It is. It is. It's Getting probably the most, back together. <laughs> probably, uh, there you go. Uh, it's very, I'm enjoying uh, being on this commission a lot. I'm also quite involved in uh, the, the UK that's hosting the G7 issues uh, is going to not surprisingly highlight dealing with pandemics as one of its priorities. And they've set up something called a, 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 pandemic, a pandemic preparedness uh, project. And I am gonna be one of the people involved in trying to come up with ideas to help them navigate that through the G7 meeting. That's really interesting. So I'm I very- think, Do you mind if I monopolize Jim and jump in with a question here? If that's okay. Um, Jim, how do you sort of marry the micro level uh, problems that we face with all of these issues with um, uh, mm -hmm. AMR, but also sort of green carbon issues, which is with me, if I've got a screaming toddler, seems to have something wrong with it. I know that just giving it a blast of antibiotics is going to kill everything. So my own private incentive is to just go for the antibiotics every time um similarly with with car emissions and so on so we have the sort of classic problem that the students will be learning about of a negative externality my individually rational decision actually has a negative connotation for society as a whole how do you think about that given your wide experience and, and what kind of specific yeah. policies can we get to just hone in on that problem so actually uh in this sense there's an aspect of amr that is more predictably easy to deal with, with proper focus than cl and climate change, given the, the, the two examples you gave. Because in fact, Richard, uh, a good 40% a good of the time, uh, giving you an antibiotic for your kid is the wrong thing to do uh, because it won't work. So if it's not, if it's, if it's a, if it's not, uh, if it's a viral infection, antibiotics don't work. And in fact, let, let, me, let me highlight something else coincidentally, uh, linked to why I was in Bristol 15 months ago, Bristol's got a very uh, active AMR research center. And uh, late last week, early this week, uh, there's a very interesting research piece published uh, around a crucial area that we pushed as one of our biggest interventions to deal with exactly that micro dilemma you highlighted. And it's the role of, uh, let's call it state-of-the-art affordable diagnostics because you raise a genuine you as a parent want something quick which at least gives you comfort to thinking you're dealing with your kid's problem and similarly yeah. uh, our pressurized doctors uh want to do something quick to get you out of their surgery uh and the way to uh to solve it is to try and find through technology very fast, rapid diagnostics that can uh, work within 15 minutes and give at least a modicum of information as to whether it's a viral infection or it's, or it's not. And uh, these guys uh, from the Bristol AMR team published a very interesting survey about it last week. Uh, and out of all the interventions we recommended, uh, this was, you know, we actually suggested to really combat AMR 
um, we have 29 ideas for the world. And we actually aggressively recommended that by 2020, a <laughs> year ago, no, no developed country should prescribe, surprisingly, no country took on board yet. Um, but your broader, your broader question is, you know, in some ways I've not answered your broader question. I think at the heart of it, and it's partly why I find all of this world increasingly fascinating, I'd, I'd link it to something that you and I, uh, Tim, I, I, I'm guessing you now know, but probably many of your audience don't know, that Richard and I coincided uh, with each other briefly uh, when George Osborne was Chancellor at the Treasury. When <clears throat> I, I was just being a nuisance and Richard was giving him good advice. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'd, ca I'd, call it, I'd call it that we need to position many of these things in, in, in a better framework to help boost the effectiveness or the legitimacy and actual operational effectiveness of modern capitalism. So we need to... I, I, I sort of summarize it as profit with greater purpose in that we, we, we seem to have evolved into a world through my professional lifetime where it's profit maximization to the point of obsession, particularly uh, apparent uh, strong short-term reporting of profit to the point of not really caring about what some of the consequences are, including some of the externalities. For example, in the AMR space, which I know so companies have no interest in producing antibiotics because they can't get 25% return on them like they can on virtually everything else. Uh, uh, and so we, we not only have an excessive demand problem, we have an increasingly sh supply shortage problem too. And uh, there's two ways of, well, there's many ways of solving it, but at the core of it, there's two. One is uh, for governments to provide more incentives to, or subsidies uh, to encourage pharmaceutical companies to produce them, or for the pharmaceutical companies to actually think a little bit differently out of their straight box and actually realize that if we, if, if, if we lose all useful antibiotics, uh, a lot of the, the much more expensive things they push like uh, a lot of oncology, it's the fashion the past decade and brilliantly successful in oncology and other forms of cancer. We, a lot of people wouldn't be able to have a lot of those operations because you wouldn't have the antibiotics to treat the infection risk. And so for something that has broader societal good, it shouldn't be positioned in a simple narrow profit line. Uh, uh, something I never thought I'd ever believe that um, if we can't find the right set of motivations or, or, or stimulants for the private sector, maybe the public sector has to start producing some of these things because society mm. needs them. I mean, we've seen, we've definitely think, seen, keep going. Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. We, we've definitely seen a much more expansive state sector within the pandemic and especially with the, the latest budget that's come out. And I think that's also a Mm -hmm. I think you described it in one article in terms of like bigging up government spending or the government playing a more active role in the economy. I, I think... Um, let, let me throw an idea. I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm going to jump in with, with uh, an idea that was specifically, without saying precisely that this is going to be one of our ideas, it's, the flavour of this will be one of our ideas. I'm interested in Richard's reaction to this. So when you, when you sort of step back and think about it, it seems to me because of some of these experiences and, and this pandemic and the reality that, that so many governments' budgets have been blown sky high and the deficit and debt levels are broadly speaking at levels none of their current or previous policymakers or advisors would have dreamt as being remotely feasible, but, but they are. So it leads me to the following idea that, that you know, I'm not the creator of it, but I'm embracing aspects of things I've heard before in a significant way that is sort of arcane of how we account for government spending 
And I, I believe uh, Gordon Brown in his early days when he was finance minister became known uh, for presiding over the development of something called the, the golden rule, which would uh, try to genuinely separate investments from consumption spending, which uh, he then went on to uh, actually ignore himself. But it seems to me we have a, we have a, a situation where most governments can't afford to tighten fiscal policy dramatically to reduce their deficits because of it might cause fresh economic recessions or worse as well as with it, significant social problems. Um, and uh, therefore, they've got to somehow live with it and manage it and present it and educate everybody, including themselves, to put the framework of it better. And, and the idea is, why not have a much more sophisticated of the modern go uh, golden rule in which we account for investment spending by governments completely differently than consumption spending uh because at the end of the day at least according to theory what, what what anybody spends on investment is supposed to create future growth uh and shouldn't be treated the same way uh as as consumption spending or, or you take it into the world of health if the current you know paying whether 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 our nurses should be paid one percent two percent or or nothing or whatever should be regarded as part of the normal health consumption spending budget. But, in, but having a, a set of tools to fight future pandemics, which could save millions of lives, and with it, billions and trillions of economic loss growth, should be treated completely differently from an accounting perspective. And, and, and one of the uh, frustrations of AMR, and I saw another question about it coming into the box about the emerging world, no, when you go to speak to policymakers about it, they immediately think about their health departments. And no, no health department in any part of the world I know is going to immediately put to one side a set of money to, to, to base on incentives for getting new antibiotics because it's competing with everything they need for day to day. And it's not obvious to me that it should be part of the health budget. It should be part of some in the British sense, some let's call it some broader cabinet office type or central budget for dealing with genuine future risks that can blow the country up. The, the irony was in the UK, partly because of our review and other things, uh, going into COVID, the UK had on its national risk register battling pandemics and AMR. And the rest of the world in principle before it was very impressed with that. But look, look, at, a, look at the disaster that has unfolded in the UK in the past year. And it's the same for the emerging world that, you know, a lot of these countries obviously can't afford a lot of this themselves, but they need a sort of pot of, uh, of various ongoing incentives to be there so that we have more readily available, quick vaccines that can be developed and a supply of antibiotics. And, you know, God knows what, what else in there in order to, to make the world a better place. And another part of it, Richard, to get, to get you and come back to me, not just on this, on this discussion, but interested in your reaction to this one too, that, you know, the IMF, who, who's, who amongst its tasks is to preside over uh, the state of the world economy and, and many of its, uh, all its member countries, particularly through something called the Article 4 series, they need to start opining about the state of the world's and, and its member countries countries health systems and i've talked to them about it and they don't want to do it because they say they've got no expertise but of course they're now starting to do it for climate change and they're going to have to do that mm. what do you think of all of that richard yeah i think it's i think it's really interesting i think that um we've been learning the first years on on the call we'll have, we've been learning about financial crisis and one of the things i was pleased to hear you, you say one of the things i said to them is that following a really big crash, really big things happen. And so we're going to move into a new world. <clears throat> I was giving them the example of 1907 and JP Morgan saving the American economy, essentially in that making America realize it needed a central bank, um, which it didn't have at that time. So, so we're going to move into a new world, I think, and, and fresh ideas like this are really needed. And that's why it's great that you're um, still actively involved in this. On your two points, 
um, accounting, yes, absolutely. I'd go even further um, because some spending, as you say, is your day-to-day -day consumption spending. Other spending helps your long-term growth. You want it accounted for differently, but um, you and I both sort of worked or worked alongside politicians and policymakers. You, you need them to publish it in a, in a specific way. So it's too tied up in the budgets and the um, OBR reports. You need a really simple metric on the front, which is your debt and deficit, including your long-term um, infrastructure spending uh, and without it. And uh, so that people can really clearly, um, so re um, reporters, the FT, the Economist, all the rest of them, really clearly report the two numbers in a different way. Um, and then on the IMF, I mean, again, you know better than me that but what we're dealing with, and that's why this new world we're going into is so interesting, and I, 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 I'm optimistic long run, is that we always deal with the policy institutions we were given by the past. So the, the IMF and the powers they had basically set out by Keynes and um, uh, what's the American guy's name, Harry Dexter White in like 1945 and it's articles of agreement. So we're dealing with something which is almost 100 years old and was based on a, on a fixed exchange rate system. We don't live in anything like that system anymore. Yeah. Uh, and the, you know, the, hot, the fact that the IMF <laughs> articles of agreement are still the same ones, I know they've been amended and they're nearly 100 years old, is kind of ridiculous. The whole thing needs a complete reboot, I agree. Mm. I think on the international context, if we could move on to China and sort of the divergence in recovery between BRICS countries. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think made China's recovery so quick and so successful? Can I, I'll, I'll just, uh, ahead of that, I'll make, I'd like to make a brief broader point um, that I'm guessing Richard's gonna, I know from his past work, a bit of a pioneer in thinking about <clears throat> aspects of this. You know, in my in my Goldman research day, by, by the way, I was chief economist before I was chair. Of, I, you know, Goldman's a big place where you can do a lot of things, but being chief economist and the chair of asset management at the same time is a little bit much. <laughs> Any, anyhow, but when I was chief economist, I presided over many things, including the creation of uh, what we called our own sustainable development index. And we did it for <clears throat> approximately 190 countries. And we, we, we tested endless variables and, and chose ones that appeared to be st statistically significant for correlating with countries' uh, long-term growth performance. And um, what was fascinating to me within the first two or three months of the pandemic hitting the world is, uh, and I've left Goldman eight years, and, and, and I don't think they have produced that index actually <clears throat> since I left, and that, that's, that's coincidence, by the way, it's not because I left. But um, the, I think that the, of the top of those that were coping best with COVID, and uh, it included quite a number of Asian countries, not China. Mm. Uh, and and what, what was particularly clear to me, and something I remembered from a long time ago, South Korea amongst them, and on some of the subcomponents of this index was the, the use of technology for all a country's citizens, not as opposed to technological innovation. Uh, and this crisis has really demonstrated to me, if, if as, as does other issues I think you're going to want to go on to, aspects of how we've all lived in through it, whether it be at school or what we're doing here. If you don't get access to, then you can't cope with a lot of things in life. And one of the reasons why the Asian countries, you know, obviously there's some exceptions, but North Asia in particular, has coped pretty well with this is obviously because of what the uh, the infectious diseases like SARS they had in the past, but because they are very very good at using modern technology, and that includes China. And if you look on the same sustainable development index, uh, even though China, my goodness me, how fashionable is it to to say that these days? When it comes to a 
an objective set of indicators about sustainable development, they score way ahead of the other BRICS countries. So it's not, in fact, they actually, the last time uh, Goldman published such an index, and I, I've helped create some others, uh, sorry, helped others create some versions of it. There's uh, Yale Self in the chief economist of KPNG has her own uh, more detailed version of the same thing. China's actually above Italy on such an index. And so that's one of the reasons, uh, many aspects of policy management. I, I would argue, and it's, it, it, it's a complex area, we don't have time to get into it here, though. on many aspects of fiscal policy management, at least cyclically, and indeed on monetary policy management, the Chinese are also very good at that. I, I will never forget, way back in 2010, Uh, going on a trip uh, to Beijing when there was a really strong mood, including in Beijing uh, among some people, about a housing bubble. And I remember going to a meeting with a bunch of mid-level Chinese bureaucrats, and they asked me whether I was worried about a Chinese housing bubble. And I jokingly said, I am now. But, but when I reflected on it afterwards, I quickly concluded that I wasn't because they were going to stop it before it became a bubble. And one of the oddities uh, of, of, of democracy hard for a democratic country to stop a housing bubble. Witness the United States in 2008, the mother of all national housing bubbles. And, and at least until then, the UK's had the same problem repeatedly through my lifetime. And I, I've debated back and forth ever since 2008 with some of the foremost and noisy people in the United States about Chinese property bubbles. And they have so far completely got it wrong. And it's because they don't give enough credit to how relatively easy it is for the Chinese authorities to make tough decisions, well, at least when it comes to cyclical issues. Now, I quickly add, there are all sorts of downsides to that, probably, that it can result, uh, certain aspects of their fiscal policy decision making can result in uh, quite a lot of misallocation of capital, probably through time. Uh, if you look at many Chinese roads to nowhere, for example, would be a good example. But certainly when it comes to the other BRICS, China on all the indicates are just simply way better at them than the other BRIC countries. Mm. I think in terms of the way China's continuing to grow, it seems that, this is just my interpretation, the housing crisis in America became global due to the world exposure to the American financial sector. Uh, the COVID became global because of the, uh, the disease moving across borders from China. Are there any other potential macro risks that are developing because of China's rapidly growing size? I mean, what springs to mind relating to this is, I believe, it, I believe you said that uh, the use of like antibiotics in animal feed, uh, creating the drug resistant bacteria within certain countries. Uh, and it could be the case that China may mm. have that risk. Are there any other additional risks you can see coming up from China's increasing dominance on the global stage? Well, there's a very simple answer to that, Tim, that the bigger China gets, the bigger its influence is in the world. And so there's all sorts of opportunities that come from that. So there's huge risks. Uh, here's a topical one for you and your colleagues as students. Um, not by at least initially deliberate planning, as has become topical uh, in what might be a challenging decade ahead for university funding in the UK. Quite a few British universities have, have become, I wouldn't describe it as dependents, but have a very large number of Chinese students uh, paying considerable amounts of money to attend those universities. 
um, probably many of those university uh, administrative people and some of their VCs today might, might wish in hindsight they were not so dependent on them given, given some of the geopolitical issues and so on. But there are, there are many, many examples. Um, but going to the core of it, and again, interested in Richard's reflection on this, is, is what, and I, I, I have a strong opinion with many populist notions finished, blah, 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 in my opinion is just ridiculous. And we can talk about that if you want. But what, what is clear is that the speed at which China grew its share of world trade was so dramatic and so many private companies and so many countries wanted to be part of it, it's created its own set of dilemmas, whether they be of the type that Donald Trump has brought to the fore so powerfully in the United States, or actually for a lot of individual companies, what happens when China no longer becomes such a cheap place to produce uh, and you're stuck with all this production capability in China and you don't really want to upset the Chinese policymakers, never mind some of the issues that you're talking about. So there, there is enormous dilemmas linked to China's uh, growing importance in the world economy. Mm. If we go and, back- And, and opportunities. Mm. If we go back to the UK, so we recently had Rishi's budgets come out. Uh, a big chunk of that was focused on regional development, particularly in uh, regions in the North. What are your thoughts on the, uh, the latest budget? I just published something on it last week, actually, uh, via the article. I thought it was okay. Uh, it was, it was, in the circumstances, quite logical. I mean, the truth of the matter is, I, sh I should have said this in the first comment, it wasn't really a classic budget. But yet again, it was sort of COVID management. Again, something Richard, very familiar with. Um, there was no multi we we have not had a a, a long term spending review from this chancellor, uh, and usually they are more indicative of what uh, an elected government in this country plans to do with its policy, and and because of COVID they keep delaying that, um, and so it wasn't really a you know anybody that makes a big judgment about this budget, I think it's a bit of a mistake. Um, with that, with that caveat, I think the broad stance he took was quite sensible. Um, I was worried the 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 the, the free market stroke right wing side of the Tory machine would try to pressurise him into uh, a lot tougher fiscal austerity very quickly, and I'm pleased that he avoided that. Uh, on the on one of the very controversial things about. Uh, announcing an intention to raise operation tax. I also think that's pretty smart. Uh, I'm of the opinion that something linked to what we were touching on before about profit with purpose, all, all that this race to slash corporation tax has done the past decade around the Western world is boost corporate profits. It's not actually boosted investments. And uh, I used to be, in, I used to get actually quite agitated uh, with our common boss, uh, George Osborne, about this sort of obsession with lowering corporation tax, because there was, there was no modern evidence that it actually worked. Mm. And so I, and, and I think particularly given a, a democratic president in the US, it's also politically quite savvy. Um, but by the way, they might not, never have to go ahead and do it. Um, and so all of that, I think, um, I, I, I wish that we'd at some point and when we're presuming we get beyond COVID, that we have a proper focus on a better strategic framework for dealing with our debt and fiscal position, which is much bolder along the lines of what Richard highlighted even more clearly than me in terms of the framework for fiscal policy and accounting. It's, it's obvious we have to do something like that. And I would also personally, as I've uh, talked a bit about publicly the past year or so, uh, I, I think we essentially the government stroke 
through the Bank of England has sort of moved to some de facto nominal GDP targeting on the, on the hope that inflation is stable, but they wouldn't mind if it rises a little, but only in a way that doesn't upset the financial markets. I, I personally think uh, a bolder thing to do would be to formally shift to nominal GDP targeting. Um, mm. I, I think that the, the era of simplistic inflation targeting uh, has passed us. Um, mm. But I'm not sure that part of the dilemma we have with this government is, A, it's been ex in existence only during COVID, <coughs> and B, with it, it's very hard to tell whether they've got any real economic philosophy. Mm. And then when it comes to the bit where you also wanted to, about Northern Powerhouse, you know, there was a bit of a sop, a bit of a sop to the regional agenda, but because it wasn't a proper budget and because there was no long-term spending review, I, I had very low expectations of what they might announce on anything related to that. And, and so on mm. the so-called leveling up agenda, you know, we, we live in hope that one day they might actually get around to trying to do something about this. If talk, if talk was enough, my goodness me! <laughs> if you were uh, if you were writing the budget, what would your uh, ideal northern regional development policy be? So I, I think the journey started on devolution a few years ago. Is should be in its infancy. I think the the idea that a bunch of smart people in Whitehall know better about things like adult skills. Uh, for the need in somewhere like, I don't know, say Grimsby or Sunderland is the same as it is in Bristol. So you have one tailor-made centrally ran policy. It's just sort of ludicrous. Mm. Uh, and I, I hope that we, we, in the future, in your, in your future, we will have a very different kind of system where there's a lot of policies and money and tax raising capability devolved to regions of, of England. Uh, I'm very, very passionate about that. It, mm. it, may, it may be a complete coincidence, but I suspect it's not fully. But we happen to be one of the most centrally run countries in the OECD and the one uh, with the biggest, with some slight exception, perhaps of Italy, with the biggest geographic inequality. And we need to give proper responsibility to accountable local policymakers uh, in order to deal with these multi-generational problems. In, in education, it's, it's pitiful. I, I, I'm a huge critic of our education department that seems to basically believe if you just build a bunch of uh, uh, new schools and call them academies, then our, our educational challenge is solved. Uh, it's, it's so naive, it's spectacular. It's embarrassing. Um, so I, I'm a strong believer of things like that. Um, and I think in the spirit of greater profit with purpose and what I'd call patient capital, I think, as I've also written about quite a bit the last 15 months, I think the case for some kind of modern version of something that emerged after the Second World War, where you have uh, a, a new entity or a series of new entities that essentially um, trying to back productivity enhancing projects around regions of the UK where they have a potential for a global edge. So for example, as it relates to the North of England in alternative energies, where the, the, government, wouldn't, the government would appoint a, a, an arm's length independent board to run it, but they would be a, a, a provider of a significant part of the capital. I think the case for doing things like that is enormous. Mm -hmm. We got what the graphics. What sense. do you make, Jim, of um, the way with which things are being kind of spread around because i know that was part of the sort of northern powerhouse idea which you sort of really championed and did loads on but um let me offer a sorry like richard a, my, my i think my i think my internet's playing up a little bit i missed i missed the first part what, what do you, you make it what do you make of the um way that the government's seeking to spread things around a lot um by which i mean yeah of course we need leveling up uh, generally, you know, I, the, the, the Southwest has pockets that, that do very well. You know, Bristol's got two tech unicorns, maybe a third coming up, yet some of our coastal towns are some of the most deprived out uh, in the UK. So we need 
general improvements in education and so on. But also with policies like this, you're trying to give a vision for your country. You're trying to just give something that, that translates globally. And for that needs to be really simple. And for the UK, it's basically, we've got London, everybody knows about London. And I kind of think that some of this regional policy should be about creating genuine competitors to London, which we used to have, namely Glasgow and Manchester, really, um, at times have claimed, had claims to be the first city of the UK, not, not just the second. And so I think things like moving stuff to Darlington and, you know, Channel 4 was moved to Leeds is great. You know, um, some of my family comes from Leeds. But it would be better to make do some national champions within cities. So I think Bristol should, should have got Channel 4. And I think if they're going to move a Department of State, they should move it to Manchester. You know, across mm -hmm. the world, Manchester's famous. We want, to, we might want to make Manchester a genuine alternative to London. So I would like to see, let's say, four national champions rather than this spreading it around the whole of the North region. But I know you're involved in some of those debates and then it gets very difficult. Like, do we give it to Manchester? Do we give it to Liverpool? Do we give it to Leeds? Can we do that? Can we create a genuine competitor to London in the UK? It's amazing how, how, off is it, how, how long it is since you and I have chatted, but we seem to sort of share... A, aspects of thinking about these things i i, I find I'm, i i am immersed in all of this and i find it spectacularly frustrating the, partly because of the politics of the red wall seats this government has a slight obsession with spreading the jam uh particularly to a lot of small towns uh and i you know i can see uh the social as well as the political attraction for doing that but in terms of really trying to do something about the national growth trend rate for the UK is ridiculous. And the whole Northern Powerhouse concept goes to the core of what you're saying that, that, you know, as often through my career, I sort of home in on what are relatively simple concepts. But we, we have in the north of England within, within a 40 mile radius of Manchester, uh, three other cities and within it, a lot of other towns that if you if you put it all around it uh, a number of uh, a population of around eight to nine million people that if you can create that as one single market uh, for consumers and producers hey presto you do create another london hmm. and that's what it should be all about uh and um what frustrates the hell out of me is that partly because of the country's history and the proud geography and rivalry, is that, you know, for the past two years, for example, and maybe longer, Manchester's often regarded these days by other parts of the North as the London of the North, you know, which is, which is, which is bizarre. You know, it's done a bit better, but it's nothing like uh, the economic vibrancy of a London. Um, and, and I saw, again, something just come up in the chat about Leeds getting the infrastructure bank. In itself, that's fine. But you can see with this government, it wants to give something to Darlington, something to Leeds, and so on and so on. And what is at the, what is at the coherent centre of that strategy? And, it, and it's I, I, somebody that's been so heavily involved in it, you know, the, this, this stuff together with AMR and, and health are the two things that dominate my, my life still. And it I find it very frustrating because I, I think you're right. We should, and, and that's not to say, by the way, that the, the choice of, of having an infrastructure bank headquartered in Leeds as part of this Northern Powerhouse thing is wrong. In fact, if it was presented as part of a broader Northern Powerhouse thing, it would be fantastic. Uh, and I'd love to see them being a lot more focused on, as with, you know, again, the frustration with many uh, aspects of our strange political democracy uh focus on the proper economics of it rather than just play games as the you know the they, they, they play in with the election timetable and the perception that it'll it'll keep them some red wall seats mm. okay cool so i think we're going to go on to q a now i know we've been interspersing it throughout the talk so if anyone's got any questions for lord o'neill please put them in the chat there's a really good one on nominal GDP targeting, Jim, which I think we'd like to hear from you. But you talked about 
could we widen it a bit because you've talked a bit about monetary policy so i'll i'll extend it to two things mm-hmm. first part is the interest rate enough or do you also need something to control asset prices you talk very clearly about house price booms and how those can be kind of decoupled almost from what you're trying to do with the main policy rate and then the second one which is from sabri um uh what about gdp targeting he says um couldn't it could it would it be too ambitious so would so i guess what he's saying is would central banks miss it a lot Mm -hmm. and implicitly that might do some damage to sort of confidence in your central bank confidence that is delivering on its on its target interesting good questions let me deal with the second one first a little bit that you know that 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 is you know, you don't you don't want to have a target that's really difficult to to measure and meet. Uh, it wouldn't be worth it at all. But as you'd know yourself, Richard, going going back in the in the earliest days of monetarism, um, a number of a small number of people articulated then the case for nominal GDP targeting, hmm. partly because the demand for money function appeared to be unstable. But at the time, the problem was uh, GDP. Uh, was reported with such a time lag uh, by the time by the time you knew what nominal GDP would be you know you might you might have completely overshot what you were trying to do uh, but I think that problem's kind of gone with the with the capability of modern technology and data uh, you know and so-called now casting there's probably people out there that can can quite cleverly construct a daily GDP certainly a weekly one uh, and we have quite quite a lot of, you know, and you've been heavily involved in it. I know you have quite a lot of uh, success on on high frequency price indicators. So I think that problem has gone. Um, but the, the reason why I find it particularly interesting is that it is for two. It links to the first question: is that if you know in the US, the US is already through the Fed and its change mandate in the autumn, a sort of going there already. But as you can see, those of you that follow markets closely can see in the past month, with more and more focus on a strong recovery and some fears of inflation picking up, the markets don't know quite what the Fed really means about inflation being a little bit above 2% for a while. And uh, if they had a, a, a something as, as simplistic as a nominal GDP target, which they weren't so prescriptive of which bit was real and which bit was prices, then I think that would partly deal with it. And by the way, as an aside, massively help the debt management problem uh, in concepts coming out of COVID. But then, then going back to the first question, this is partly what started me off in this belief. If, if you look at QE and inflation targeting that, really the the past decade because of the general undershoot central banks doing the job of what they're mandated to do have constantly wanted to keep monetary policy remarkably easy even though there's very little evidence that it's actually helping anybody in the real world and what it's really done has has contributed in a big way in my opinion to what's been the most spectacular decade for financial asset prices, ironically. Uh, and I think it's a huge error. Uh, and because that's that's at the core of uh, the whole issue about uh, wealth inequality, which I often think some of the issues about income inequality are actually technically incorrect, but certainly on wealth inequality, if you've owned a house in London... <clears throat> And had uh, you know ownership a lot of a lot of bond funds and a lot of equity funds the past decade, you've done pretty well. And uh, by our central bank being fo- told to focus on inflation targeting, uh, and with repeated undershoots, uh, they've played a pretty big role in contributing to that, as have others around the world. And it just doesn't to me. It's it's kind of out of date. It's sort of lost its purpose. You know, never mind. We, we, don't, we haven't even got into any of this. But if you bring in climate change and, you know, perhaps in order to foster a world of net zero, we're going to have to have our central banks having that as part of their mandate. And coming back to a, another part of the question that I should have said earlier on, I, I do believe, and, and this was a great thing of the Mark Carney days at the Bank of England, 
having a more uh, uh, active role in 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 guidance to uh, uh, allocation of um, of capital ratios, I think is a very smart way to try and deal with that. And we should have had better, stronger counter cyclical uh, adjustment of that to do with the way markets perform. Uh, oh, okay. Shameless plug um, while Tim's going to his next question from me for the Economics Observatory for everyone. Um, Jim, I'm not sure if you know that much about this project, but it's a new cross UK university project with a hub here in Bristol. Um, and we've got loads of stuff on uh, household wealth and how, how it's zoomed up and also how unequal it's been. To Jim's point, we've also got a really interesting article on how green are central banks. Because it turns out that when you do all this QE, so again, that's going out there to buy asset prices to push up uh, the prices of bonds and down the yields. It's another way, basically, of lowering interest rates. You have to buy the bonds of many different types of companies. And it turns out people have done the analysis that you're buying lots of bonds of lots of very polluting companies. <laughs> so QE itself, particularly the ECB, this is the data it's for, is actually a, a kind of non-green policy. So that's quite an interesting piece. I'll drop it into the chat. Mm. Back to you, Tim. Yeah, so I think we've got a question coming from Isabel asking, how much appetite do you think there is within government slash central banks for real lasting changes of response to this crisis? So I think this goes to the core of like making the most of a crisis. I, you know, my, on, my honest answer is I don't know. Um... Uh, the Monty Commission that I, I mentioned earlier includes some people from the world of policy uh, and some people that work at central banks and the development banks. And they, they, you know, I'm excited about some of the things they say. Um, but as, you know, as we see, and I hesitate, I'm trying to think of the right way to describe it. Uh, also, having gone through a lot of crisis, I'm quite familiar with this is that when time passes people's memory fades pretty quickly uh and that's why uh the beauty of, of a crisis is trying to get some things changed uh or the the momentum behind a change before the before time passes and the memory fades because i think we have got a moment on many of these things uh I, i'm i'm quite in, impressed by some of the things i hear uh, about the idea of changing capital adequacy ratios linked to net zero targets. And I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that within five years, maybe sooner, that, that in, in, in some of the more developed countries, we actually have that. Uh, but I would be equally unsurprised if, if some other crisis came along that it blew them off course from really focusing on it. <clears throat> but mm. there's, there's, there's nothing like a crisis to force people to think differently. That's fascinating. Um, I think we've got a couple more questions in chat. Yeah, I'm a bit mindful of the time here. Yes, there. cool. Um, okay, if we wrap up here, uh, thank you very much, Lord O'Neill. I'll, I'll take, if you want to, I'll, oh, okay. we'll, I'll take the last couple. Very we'll take, we'll take the, uh, the last question. So I think this links to something you got published uh, yesterday. It says, do you think cryptocurrencies are threats to the power of central banks? Oh. If so, how <laughs> should it be addressed? I, I saw that just creep up on the chat. Yeah, I, I actually had, I was asked by, I, I write for something called Project Syndicate every month. And last week, last uh, week, uh, it was quite sort of daft, but also quite flattering in a way. <clears throat> they wrote to me and asked me to write about what I thought about the whole thing. So I, I did. And, it, and funnily enough, the day they asked me, I'd also been uh, asked by a, uh, somebody I know well, whether I'd consider setting up uh, one of these co so-called SPACs, these, which are all the rage in special uh, vehicles for essentially, essentially making a lot of money very quickly is what, from what I can see. <laughs> and so I, I sort of start this piece off by jokingly saying I wanted to combine the two together. I was going to set up my own crypto SPAC. So I'd be, I'd be very fashionable. That would sell at hotcakes. That, uh... I'd, I'd, be, I'd be very cool if I did that. But uh, <laughs> as I quickly added, it would be almost definitely the case that uh, my, my whole professional reputation would be in tatters within three months of doing it. Listen, I, you know, I, I often think I'm not the, the most conventional of economic thinker. But on this particular issue, I, I, I am reasonably conventional. It seems to me that 
uh, for, for something to be a permanent currency, it needs to satisfy three basic criteria all the time. And uh, the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being the best example, plays at it. But, but there's no evidence whatsoever that it, it can or will do, particularly on things like store of value and a credible means of exchange. Uh, and I just, just don't get it. And I, I, you know, hats off to the people. And I know some people very well that have made a ridiculous amount of money being long this thing. Uh, but as I end up saying in that piece, Let's see what happens uh, as and when the Federal Reserve Board starts to raise interest rates. I wouldn't want to personally be too long a crypto that day. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. And one final question. You've caught yeah. some of the, uh, the greatest trends in global finance. What's your call on United Milan? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? It's only a noddy competition anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> Us United fans these days are, get... The only solace we get is from the complete collapse of Liverpool, which has probably been the most enjoyable thing that I've experienced so far in time. I mean, I mean last was. Saturday wasn't bad. I mean, sorry, last Sunday. Ah, City aren't even serious. Even though they win everything, City aren't even a serious football team. So, you know. For, for those who don't know, like, Jim, like Jim did nearly buy out United at one point. They're like, City, Manchester City are like some kind of FIFA football game. <laughs> Oh, well said, well said. Uh, thank you very much, Lord O'Neill. It's been All a right, pleasure my having pleasure. you. Richard, nice surprise. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks, Jim.